There is a particular questioning technique so powerful, so rare, so memorable, that if mastered, will make you a feared questioner. Curious? Let's begin with an example. In 2018, Senator Durbin questioned Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg over a data leak. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um... <laughs> Uh, no. If you've messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that may be what this is all about. Senator Durbin's point was that serious privacy violations had occurred on Facebook. And he used Mark Zuckerberg as a medium to persuade others of this. He came up with questions to create that impression. Indeed, the conversation wasn't between Senator Durbin and Zuckerberg. It was between Durbin, you, the public, and his colleagues. Senator Durbin has mastered the art of silent conversation. Zuckerberg's answers were obvious, but that's the point behind Durbin's questions. If Zuckerberg had refused to answer, or given a different answer, his credibility would have been affected. Watch him hesitate again. Um. <laughs> uh. I'd guess he was trying to say yes, but couldn't. Asking tough questions is simple. First, ask yourself who your audience is and what impression you want to give them. Then choose questions that will create that impression. It's simple, but many people fall into booby traps. Booby trap 1. You can't substantiate what you say. Let's watch an interview of a Canadian political leader. Currently, you're obviously taking the populist uh, pathway. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> well, ap appealing, appealing to people's uh, more emotional levels, I would guess. Um, I mean, certainly, you mean certainly, you, certainly, you tap, certainly you tap uh, very strong ideological language quite frequently. Like what? Uh, left wing, you know, this and that, right wing, they, you know, I mean, it's that, that type of ideological never talk about, I never really talk about left but or right. Anyways, a lot I of don't really believe in that. Okay. A lot of people would, would say that you're simply taking a page out of the Donald Trump uh, well, book. Like which people would say that? Well, I'm sure a great many Canadians, but... Like who? <laughs> I don't know who, but... Well, you're um, the one who asked the question, so yeah. how, you must know somebody. If only the questioner had examples. Let's call those questions level 1 questions. They can be defeated by people eating apples. If there's anything good about such questions, it's that they are better than level 0 questions. Nobody understands level 0 questions. Mr. Chu, does TikTok access the home Wi-Fi network? Only if the user turns on the Wi-Fi. I, I'm sorry, I may not understand. If the answerer is kind, they may even try to help you. It will have to, to access the network to get connections to the internet, if, if that's the question. Let's move on to level 2 questions. What's level 2? You can explain what you mean and give examples. Let's listen to a BBC journalist questioning a Singapore leader. The, the authoritarianism that underpins that approach to managing a society feels uncomfortable to us. Yeah, I mean, it's a democracy of sorts. You, you don't have a genuinely free, truly liberated prayer. When, when journals that are respected and, and have a role to play, yeah. like, you know, the Far East Economic Review, yeah. for years and years mm. are hounded. He's obviously more well prepared than the other journalists, but he can't show that he's unambiguously correct. Do you believe, does Singapore believe in the notion of a safety net for those who fall between the cracks of a successful economy? I believe in the notion of a trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Singapore leader argued that he had something better, so the reporter wasn't able to create his desired impression. Indeed, Level 2 questions won't work if your opponent can find a good answer. So pick an issue as unambiguous as possible. In the real world, 
things are rarely 100% unambiguous, but try to keep the ambiguity negligible. Also, we all have blind spots, so stress test your question. Ask others, how will the answerer respond? Give yourself bonus points if they are familiar with the answerer. There's no substitute for talking to others. If you don't, your questions will almost always have some flaw. One common flaw is that a question has a strong assumption. So you, you mentioned the Navy, for example, and that we have fewer ships than we did in 1916. Well, Governor, we also have fewer horses and bayonets because the nature of our military has changed. We have these things called aircraft carriers where planes land on them. We have these ships that go underwater, nuclear submarines. And so the question is not uh, a game of battleship where we're counting ships. It's, it's what are our capabilities? Indeed, the number of ships isn't a good measure of a Navy's strength, especially when you're comparing to one century ago. And Obama pounced on that. Also, if what you say can be interpreted in multiple ways, the answerer can make a comeback. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah, because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> this comeback was so memorable, it's easy to forget everything else in the debate. If you got your facts wrong, your opponent will have a good answer. That's like asking me whether I stopped beating my wife. I mean, I'd never beat my wife. Or people can easily answer without losing their credibility. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Senator, I'm Singaporean. No. Have you ever been associated or affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party? No, Senator. Again, okay. I'm Singaporean. Your questions also need to be consistent with each other. Let's listen to one of Nelson Mandela's greatest comebacks. Mr. Copper, you have not listened to my argument. If you have done so, then you have not been serious in examining it. I have replied to one of our friends here that I have refused to be drawn into the differences that exist between various communities inside the USA. <clears throat> you have not commented that I am going to offend anybody by refusing to involve myself in the internal affairs of the USA. <clears throat> of the USA. <laughs> Why are you so keen that I should involve myself in the internal affairs of Cuba and Libya? No. I expect you to be consistent. I don't know if I have paralyzed you. No, 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 no. I... <laughs> If you want to paralyze your opponent, it's better to identify a clear-cut, problematic issue. Let's call that a level 3 question. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is also known as AOC. Let's hear her question, Mark Zuckerberg. Can you explain why you've named The Daily Caller, a publication white, uh, well documented with ties to white supremacists as an official fact checker for Facebook? Congresswoman, sure. We actually don't appoint the independent fact checkers. They go through an independent organization called the Independent Fact Checking Network that has a rigorous standard for who they allow to, uh, to serve as a fact checker. So you would say that white supremacists tied uh, publications meet a rigorous standard for fact-checking? Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman, I would say that we're not the one assessing that, that standard. The International Fact-Checking Network is the one who is setting that standard. AOC focuses on a small issue that's clearly problematic. That's more damaging than focusing on a large issue that isn't necessarily problematic. Indeed, the answer to AOC's last question is so obvious, Zuckerberg's explanation doesn't sway me. The issue is not who appoints the fact-checkers, it's whether the fact-checkers are good. So have at least one question with an obvious answer. Make sure it creates the impression you want to create, and any other answer would not be a good answer. Let's watch AOC do it again, 
She questions a military contractor for overcharging. What I've found is that uh, the, the cost of about 149 of these clutch discs will cost, at, at cost, is about $4,768, except Transdime charged the public $215,007. That is a margin of about $210,239. Mr. Howley, are you aware how many doses of insulin we could get for that? For that margin? I'm not. AOC has caught Haley in a double bind. If he says yes, he admits to exorbitant pricing. If he says no, AOC gets to explain how big the margin is. And she does. In a single payer healthcare system, an insulin dose can cost about $137 uh, a vial. I could have gotten over 1,500 people insulin for the cost of the margin of your price gouging for these vehicular discs alone. So my question to you is, why should we give you another dime? It seems to me the government always has the choice of what to buy and what not to buy from us. How much competition do you have? How many competitors do you have in this market? There's almost no product we make where there aren't other alternatives mm -hmm. to buy the part. But it could we be one alternative, two alternatives, or a thousand alternatives. Not a thousand. Not a thousand. Some number of alternatives. This term free market comes up very often, but I don't think people really understand what that means because so often it's not a free market at all. It's a captive market. It's one where we're forced to choose between two to three people. Oftentimes in these processes, there is significant uh, argument and there's significant evidence that there's collusion in these markets, that it's not a perfectly competitive market because a perfectly competitive market requires a large amount of competitors. AOC was well prepared. She was like a professional chess player. She anticipated Haley's moves and she strategically positioned her pieces, I mean questions, to take down the counter argument. Her message was clear. The contractor had unfairly benefited from a lack of competition. Questions like this persuaded the company to refund $16 million it had received. Sometimes the toughest questions are simple and factual. In 2021, Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes went on trial for fraud. At trial, Holmes blamed Sunny Bawani for much of her behaviour. She said that her ex-boyfriend and ex-COO abused her. Two simple questions showed that Holmes was wrong. Prosecutor. He was an at will employee? Yes. So you could fire him at any time? Yes. When dealing with moral issues, rhetorical questions can be extremely effective. In 2005, the CEO of one of Singapore's biggest charities was questioned about his ethics. T.T. Durai asked rich and poor Singaporeans to donate to the National Kidney Foundation. Then he spent donor money questionably. And he sued a news agency for defamation when they reported on him. Let's see the questions that shifted the opinion of the judge and the public. Davinder Singh, so for the past three years you have earned about 1.8 million from the NKF. Yes. And a man who earns $1,000 a month who takes out $50 of his pay packet every month thinking that it is going to save lives, should he not know that is the kind of money you earn? There is nothing wrong with the money I earn. You will lose all authority, all moral authority to look at him in his eyes. Isn't that right? That is not true. If he knew that you were flying first class on his money, you could not look him in the eyes. Isn't that true? It is not true. If he knew that his salary couldn't even buy the bathroom fittings in your private office suite, you couldn't look him in his eyes. That is not true. The answers were so obvious, Dirai's denials had zero effect. That's why Davinder Singh could continue with his questions, as if Dirai had answered yes to all of them. Singh's questions shone a spotlight on hidden truths. They led to public outreach and a government investigation. Dirai resigned a few days later. Let's recap what we learned. Know who your audience is and what impression you want to create. Then ask yourself, what questions will lead the audience to that impression? Have questions where the answer is so obvious, no one will believe any other answer. 
focus on issues that are clearly problematic, even if they are small. Anticipate counter-arguments so you can demolish them. Make sure the questions themselves aren't ambiguous, don't have strong assumptions, and get your facts right. Also, make sure your questions are consistent with each other. Finally, talk to others to get feedback on your questions. One additional tip I didn't give earlier is to come up with as many good questions as possible. This helps you be more adaptable, because it can be difficult to know what will come out of the answerer's mouth. It's a simple process, you just need to practice carefully. Once you get good at silent conversations, you have a rare and powerful tool. There's only one thing to be aware of. This tool, like any other tool, can be used for good and bad. Use it wisely.